podcast and today I'm going to talk about the uh, terror tactics which were used by Nazi Germany in order to make its uh, initial attacks at the very beginning of World War II. And um, anyway, so if you want to ask any questions, please feel free to do so. And as usual, I'll, uh, I'll say what I want to say and then I'll come on to the questions. Questions can be related uh, to anything. Now, yesterday I published a video related to what's called um, the uh, Bloody Sunday in Bromberg. Uh, Bromberg being Bidgosh in Poland, Bromberg, the German word for that, that city. And um, this has become something which has become um, quite well known, very famous. Uh, largely because this was the excuse that was used by the Nazis for all of the terror uh, that they did uh, afterwards in Poland, or one of the main reasons of uh, the excuses that they gave. However, um, it was a, it, as it turns out, it was a rather weak excuse, and it's something which they were largely responsible for themselves. Now the. Uh, at the end of the First World War, large numbers of German-speaking people found themselves outside of the country where they had originally come from. Uh, that's to say, Germany. Uh, so, um, not and not only that, uh, they found themselves in places. You know, people who had been uh, living in Austria, Austrian citizens, now found themselves in Czechoslovakia and um, or, or even Yugoslavia and other places. Um, the, um, uh, this created, of course, a certain amount of uh, potential problems. Now, when we talk of nationality and ethnicity, it's very difficult to actually make a definition of what it means. And certainly there are people who may have been, you know, people who were German speakers, but they were living in Poland or somewhere. Then they, uh, I think the majority of them would have seen themselves as being Polish or part of the Polish state. Uh, this, um, at the end of the First World War and borders were redrawn. And in many cases, for example, if you take the Polish border in the West, it wasn't much different from the border that it existed uh before uh the the partitions of poland so it was really just putting the clock back and people often say well that's ours ours uh well it just depends how far you go back into what what, what your objective is um the the fact the fact of the matter is is that no land can be said to belong to anybody unless they have a title deed to prove it at least that's my opinion as far as the uh, after the First World War, so you had these people who were, for example, Germans, and there were people who did leave, and there was a ma mass emigration from the lands uh, which were, for example, uh, deemed to be a part of Poland. Um, some some groups, for example, above all, to take the case of Jews, Jews left uh, in uh, quite large numbers from these uh, territories, and they went to live in Germany itself. And as it turned out, that was, uh, well, uh, that may, may or may not be turned out to be a mistake. That's a subject for a different time. Um, and so they didn't really want to, to go to these, the, these new countries. Czechoslovakia was a relatively new idea. And so the, the creation of this state to be a home for the uh, Slav Slavonic speaking peoples. Uh, but it f had the previous borders of Austro-Hungary and large amounts of Germans were living in the, um, the uh, in, in Austro-Hungary. If you go there today, in fact, I mean, you go go to the border areas, and you want to know what national what, what language people spoke, go to a graveyard, and you can see there what language the graves are actually written in, and that's 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 a dead giveaway. And um, so if you, the area which is, has been called Sudetenland, that has um, uh, everywhere, the, the graves are in German, they're not in, they're not in Czech. Uh, so um, that, that shows what the ethnicity of these people were. But another thing which needs to be borne in mind is that uh, it's the will of the people. And the fact that uh, they uh, may be speaking a different language to what the majority of people in that country spoke doesn't mean to say that they want to belong to that. In Czechoslovakia, 
two of the German par heads of two of the German parties were Jewish, and they certainly didn't want to be part of Nazi Germany. And uh, one escaped, the other one was caught, and he was murdered. So um, it, these these things, I think, uh, clearly need, do need to be borne in mind. Now, the um, the uh, in Poland, uh, as an example, uh, there were all sorts of organisations which. Uh, could have been, um, which could be pe German uh, speaking people could join. So there were, was a s sort of an uh, e um, external organization in Berlin which arranged it's just the same as today in Poland. There are organizations uh, for those Polish people or Polish speaking people who are in different uh, countries, particularly those, for example, who were deported to Siberia uh, and then um, in many, okay, or Kazakhstan, and they're still living there today. So um, they, the, these organizations could have been simple things like scouting organizations or cultural or literary um, or chess clubs or things of this nature. And uh, they could apply for grants from uh, Germany itself and uh, uh, another thing is that which was open to Germans but was not open to Poles uh, or, or, or Czechs is the fact that they could get uh, business sorry not Czechs uh, just Poles just Poles um, is that they could get business grants from uh, from Germany and so the German government for those uh, Germans who had been left behind so to speak they could get all of these grants and all sorts of other things. So they, it, the conditions were very uh, positive. There were in both uh, the, in the Czech Parliament, the, the German uh, speak, uh, German speakers had a very significant, a very significant part in politics. Uh, in the Polish Parliament, less so. But in the Polish Parliament, because of the, I mean, the, about, about two thirds of the population were ethnic. Polish, the rest were made up of all sorts of other other groups, the largest being Ukrainian, second largest uh, Jewish, third Germans, fourth Belarusians, for example. And um, so there were organized, not only organizations, but they had representation in parliament. Now, I agree that the Polish uh, government in the from the from, us from 1926 onwards was uh, Poland wasn't a particularly democratic country um it was a it was sort of a it's being described as being a dictatorship without dictators uh particularly after the death of Piłsudski but the um uh, there were certain rights which existed now the policy of Hitler uh, initially was to for any group that wanted to sort of rock the boat had to be kept in order for example here uh, where I am now in Gdansk, then the uh, plan was. Uh, oh, there's somebody trying to park next to me now. Is oh oh yo yo he's gonna really close. I'm not I'm not gonna get out of this van. Never mind. I'll uh, I'll have to wait for them to leave. <laughs> uh, uh, so um, so he just put me off then. This is what happens when you do a live broadcast like this. Some, something happens and then you can't see what's. What's going on? Never mind. If I can't open the door, I'll just have to wait for them to to go. I have to leave via the uh, the the roof window. Um, so the uh, the German um, what Hitler wanted to do was to have peace. So anybody who wanted to the Nazis in in Gdansk, for example, he he told them to sort of uh, to behave themselves and don't rock the boat. He wanted an alliance with. Poland, he did his best to reach out hand, friend, ha, friendship to Czechoslovakia, less so to Austria. Austria was marked as one of his, his targets almost from the beginning and there was an attempted coup d'etat by Nazis in 1934 which failed but um, it was clear that, that Austria would be the uh, would be the target. Now, when he uh, decided that uh, Czechoslovakia would be a target, what he did was to pro try to provoke incidents. Now, the German population, the German speaking population in Czechoslovakia, which largely was, um, it wasn't anti Czech uh, to any great extent, but there was one party which was uh, under a person called Heinlein, and um, uh, the uh, and Heinlein, uh, 
Heinlein, sorry, Heinlein. Uh, and he uh, was one who wanted unification with Germany. And so this, his party w was financed directly from Berlin, the same as, for example, the British Union of Fascists was financed by, by, the, uh, by, by Nazi Germany. And uh, so the, uh, what, given the fact the plan was to destabilize the country, and then you, that was done by using these groups, so either financing them um, uh, first of all, but then to use agents who would infiltrate the countries and then uh, either train people in use of weapons or whatever and try to provoke um, some kind of response. Now, the, it, the response site worked like this. If they could um, do something so that the Czech police would react with uh, violence, then um, the other, uh, the, the, the German speaking population might rebel against those, against the police, and see that the Nazis uh, were their friends. That is how it worked. So uh, this was organized by, it just doesn't, uh, it things this, there doesn't seem to be central organization. The first is the German military intent, uh, intelligence, the Abwehr. And to give one of their agents was none other than Oskar Schindler, uh, later of Schindler's List. He actually worked for the Abwehr and he was involved in this type of, it would seem he was involved in this type of activity, both in Czechoslovakia and later in Poland. Uh, um, the, uh, it was also organized by the SS. Now, at the beginning of World War II, for example, a number of so-called frontier incidents uh, were arranged whereby uh, there would be uh, uh, the, these commando groups or terrorist groups would get into Polish uh, uh, territory, then they would do something and then they would uh, clear off. And for example, the, the, the excuse used on the 1st of September, what mo the best known excuse is they attacked a, ra a, a um, radio transmitter, a place called uh, Gliwice, Gliwice in German, and uh, they made a po pro-Polish uh, statement and then um, there was a shootout, and of course it was all it was all faked because the uh, the people who were left there dead and dressed in Polish uniforms were in fact um, people who come from Dachau and had just been murdered. Uh, the, the, the the speech in Polish had been made by one of these people who had grown up in Poland, uh, although a native German speaker. And uh, so in these areas there was a lot of people who lots of people who spoke both languages. And so this was just a hangover from the times when Prussia had uh, occupied uh, parts of Poland in the in the 19th century. People who lived in these areas continued to speak the language that they spoke. So it's largely these terrorist attacks are the reason why suddenly there's all of the, the, these um, refugees, which suddenly the German refugees, which suddenly start appearing, and they started appearing in Czechoslovakia in September of 1938. You don't see them before then, and you see them appearing in um, from Poland in August 1939. You don't see them before then. So it was these terrorist acts which led to the, uh, um, the, the, the these populations um, feeling that they um, were downtrodden by the others. Now, in the case of Poland, for example, uh, what happened was that the uh, just before the war started, um, the, uh, the the uh, the Polish government, realizing what was happening, then started trying to round up uh, German um, uh, uh, or community leaders or people who thought could be involved in terrorist activity and anything like that. Uh, now this was done really, really quickly. Uh, ever. It, it, they weren't looking for evidence, uh, not just Germans, well, Ukrainians as well, who thought it could have been loyal to the Soviet Union, although, as it happened, there was no, nothing, nothing like that actually occurred. And um, this, in turn, led to armed clashes in some places, and which led to German people being killed. Uh, I mean, Poles as well. Uh, deaths occurred on both sides. Uh, but this was why um afterwards the 
um, the, the claims were made of the massacre in Bidgosht and in other places. I don't doubt that sometimes when you try and create ethnic tensions, I don't doubt as well that some there may have been some Polish yobos uh, attacking attacking uh, their German neighbours. Um, that that I'm pretty certain did happen. But uh, on the other hand, this was created by the Nazi state in order to um, do what it, to, to have an excuse to occupy. Now, if we look what happened in both Crimea and in the Donbass, we see today's Nazis doing exactly the same thing, or they have done exactly the same thing. So if you look at the people who are in charge in these so-called uh, uh, People's Republics in Donetsk and uh, Lugansk, then you'll see that nearly all of them come from Russia, in, or, or have, were previously involved in uh, criminal activities. So they're sort of like crime bosses or something like that. Uh, particularly in the case of uh, Crimea, it was, it was organized crime, which uh, had a lot to play in the, uh, the, the Russian takeover. So it's these infiltration tactics, which I think uh, are particularly dangerous. Um, and that is, um, that this this was directly copied in the video put up yesterday. If, if those understand German, you can see there's people actually uh, talking about uh, their their experiences in Poland, and um, so uh, uh, which I, I, I don't I don't know. I've tried to find out where these things happened, but but I can't. Either a it was made up. Or B, the attackers themselves were Germans, just pretending to be Poles. Or, or C, maybe they were actually telling the truth and they were attacked by Poles. I don't know. I can't say. I, I haven't been able to verify it. Okay, right, let's have a look. Sorry, so that's about it for uh, I'll have a look the questions. Hello, Annie and David and, uh, uh, and Ian and... Uh, also, the biggest cycling event has been in uh, Ian's hometown for the last two weeks, and oh, so and the bike shops have been in pandemonium. Um, and uh, thanks, Ian, for that the compliment. Uh, did Poland at the time have freedom of the press? Yes, on the whole. Yeah, I mean there was sent. Well, not the same extent as there is today. But but the, there was a certain amount of censorship. Um, I'm trying to think of things that were censored. But I mean, but you could more or less publish whatever you want. There was, there were communist papers. Um, there were, there were people even because it was, it was a pretty far right government in Poland. It wasn't a, as I said earlier, it wasn't a democracy. I mean, it was pretty anti-Semitic as well. I mean, some of the things that they did, uh, it, it worked as uh, like, like a colonial government. And then again, you know, the Britain and France, Spain, uh, well, Britain, France and Portugal had colonies as well. Only the the difference being, of course, is that the the, the um, government in Poland uh, treated the people in Ukraine as though that were a part of a colony. Um, the uh, or people where well, there was a Ukrainian majority, um, less so in because there was I, nowhere I could say that there was German majority in any any part of Western uh, uh, Western Poland. Uh, there, uh, in any large area, sorry, there were towns which spoke German, German. But if you went into the countryside, the countryside around them would be, for example, Polish speaking. Uh, so anyway, I would say on the whole, yes, there's freedom of the press in Poland in the 20s and the 30s. And uh, right. Uh, I'm best. Uh, thanks, James in Ireland. Thank you. Uh, do Poles today dislike Germans? The current government has been attempting to do its best to stir up problems with Germany and it always um, resorts to attacking Germans. I was listening today to Jarosław Kaczynski, something I definitely don't recommend anybody does, and he, he, he was then hinting at things again is that the Germans are stopping Poland uh, progressing. Absolute and utter nonsense. He knows it, but he's using it to to stir up uh, the very same type of uh, um, problems that, that Hitler wanted to, to stir up. Maybe maybe Kaczynski doesn't intend on invading Germany, uh, but um, it the, it is used 
constantly by the current governing party and uh, to, to do it and you, you often see with these memes as well and Facebook and the likes which which are, are often anti anti German um, the uh, I having said that this is not the uh, feelings I would say of the vast majority of, of people uh, in my opinion so um, but there is there is anti-german feeling amongst some some undoubtedly and this, this is this is to a large extent encouraged by the, the current government uh, I've been asked do I lift weights no but I should do yeah that's a good question and I would actually it's not true I do actually lift weights occasionally what I will do um, when I'm sort of watching something I'll get a, a bottle in both hands and I'll just do this so that to, to get a bit of practice I saw some research uh, two days ago it said that one of the best well, not the best is the right word but one of the strongest um, reasons for early death is uh, sitting for eight hours or more a day so there you go so lift weights if you can um, okay uh, Ian. Ian says saying Germans were not safe in Czechoslovakia and they had to act. Yes, this is this is the whole point of what the uh, what the Nazis there attempted to do. Uh, same same as what Putin tried tried in the Donbass. In the Donbass, there wasn't wasn't any problems at all. In fact, there hadn't been problems ever. And this is something which was entirely produced by Putin. Uh, put now in the case of uh, Germans in Czechoslovakia, of course, they'd only lived in Czechoslovakia for 20 years, or even slightly less, really. So, um, I think part of this, though, is also because this thing to do with um, I expect things, I expect that things to be better for me because I'm superior to these other people. This type of attitude, the attitude of privilege and um, uh, expectations that I shall uh, I'm entitled that's the word entitlement and I came up I came up with this 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 idea I was watching um Tucker Carlson another person I don't recommend watching uh, and it was that I just realized what he was some jumped up kid uh, comes from a very wealthy background and he he feels he's entitled to all these things that other people aren't should shouldn't have he doesn't want people having the same access to whatever it is is as he has if they've got a different color face so uh, I think a lot of this is entitlement and if for example you had been a part of a country which gave you uh, better more advantages and there were more advantages for, for Germans and there were over Czechs uh, despite the fact that there were plans maybe to make uh, uh, Austro-Hungary to become Austro-Czechoslovakia or something like that, it was this was pr proposed by the um, uh, the heir to the throne who was later shot at Sarajevo. Um, so I I think that's part of it. Um, being ruled by Prague and not from Vienna um, that that might have bothered some people. It might have bothered some people. Not everybody. Yeah, these are fl false flags. And anyway, so I've got here a question, Vegan. What should Poland have done? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I, I, in a case like this, I really don't know because the the the, the Polish government uh, in between the wars has got a lot of responsibility for what happened later. Uh, the Polish government was more than it did nothing to help out Austria zero. It participated in the attack on Czechoslovakia. Well, what it could have done was give diplomatic support to Austria to start off with. Uh, maybe because the attack on Austria was so quick that there wasn't really a chance. But certainly in the case of Czechoslovakia, it should have given hard diplomatic support and, uh, and also declared that it would help defend Czechoslovakia. We know that now. The Polish... Uh, uh, the combined strength of the Polish and Czechoslovakian army was greater than that of the German army. Uh, Czechoslovakia was one of the largest uh, weapons producers in the world. I think the second largest uh, weapons producing plant in the world was in uh, Czechoslovakia. So and it was largely Czech weapons which were used to defeat Poland first and then France uh, to a very large degree. So um, this um, uh, Hungary 
um, when it was there were talks between Hungary and Nazi Germany about attacking and uh, the hung, uh, um, haughty the Hungarian region, he said, "No way! They'll they'll, they'll, they'll massacre us if we take uh, if we do anything against them." Um, and that was as late as 1938. Uh, the, the Czechs could uh, be in Budapest in no time at all, uh, and certainly could five minutes flying time. I think he said. Uh, it's probably a bit more than that, but um, so this is, I think, what the Polish government should have done. Uh, it also did nothing to help Lithuania either. When Lithuania was attacked by Nazi Germany in March 1939, and Memel, um, the Kraipeda, was uh, attacked and annexed, it did absolutely nothing to assist. So the problems, I think, these countries in in Central Europe, which could have done some, if had they shown a far more sensible, pol got away from nationalism and tried helping each other out, then then the, the dictatorships, um, both, both Stalin and Hitler, would not have been found them such easy prey uh, as, as they were. All right, so, yes, Poland, Colin says, Poland did a land grab on Czechoslovakia. Poland took an area uh, to the uh, east, east, west, sorry, of the Olza River. And it wasn't a very large area, it actually I cycled from one end to the other in, in very little time. But the first shots of World War II were, uh, if we take, take the, it was a, a, a attack on the Jabłonkowo Pass, or Jabłonków in Czech Pass. Uh, which was in Polish occupied Czechoslovakia. I've actually done a video on this, although it hasn't been. It hasn't. I haven't even. Um, I've written it. I've written it. Uh, I've finished it, but I haven't. I haven't put the pictures in and all the rest. Of it, yes, but the um, uh, the resistance between uh, the res uh, resistance to the Nazis uh, in this area, the Czechs and the Poles wouldn't cooperate, and even as far as North Africa. There were Czechs from this area refused to, to serve under Polish officers, and um, you know so that it, 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 that shows how how it affected um, uh, the the, uh, the the Allied effort in the Second World War. Uh, the, this Polish attack against Czechia, I mean, it, it can it, it absolutely no way can this be justified. Although, of course, the current government there. Uh, I think I think before long it will pretend it never happened, but uh, it, 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 it is a shocking act. And not only that, it, this this affected the, the help that was given to Poland. There was, uh, for example, I think it was General Vagan Vagon uh, in in France said to um, Polish military de de um, delegation there, you know, about what they did, what you did against Czechoslovakia, you know, and we we're coming to your help. Um, I, Something was said in the British Parliament how the the, the um, Czechoslovak nothing was done to help democratic Czechoslovakia, and now we're saying we're going to help the same very same Poland which had attacked Czechoslovakia, and uh, in far more difficult circumstances. Uh, Doc writes, I have numerous questions that aren't necessarily terror tactics related. Why UK and France didn't actually do anything immediately post uh, on the 3rd of September 1939? How come war wasn't declared against the United, against the Soviet Union? Okay, good. Uh, right, the that that is, that this isn't actually true because it, the France attacked Germany uh, within the I think uh, the, the 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 treaty obligations put it to within two weeks and it did it did that. It there was the Saar offensive. Um, okay, it, it did. Uh, it even pierced the Maginot Line, not the Maginot Line, the Westphal. And uh, but the, there was clearly that France was in no way of actually attacking. Uh, the problem was in the the. If you look at the border, it's it, today it's more or less in the same. No, sorry, it's not more or less. It is absolutely in the same place. Um, you, can cr you can forget about crossing the Rhine. So you've got this uh, stretch of border. And the place where it was actually uh, the border was drawn was drawn at the end of the Napoleonic War, and in a place which would make it difficult for France to attack uh, in an easterly direction in the future. So there was that. So what, a question more is: Well, what would you expect 
um, the, the Allies to do. Britain um, did uh, the, the war at sea was very um, it was intense from the beginning. The Ark Royal was sunk. Uh, the, there was the Battle of the River Plate, for example. So the the war in the West did start. I just honestly don't see what else the Allies could do with the technology that existed at the time. And you've always got to bear that one in mind. So could, for example, a massive bombing raid against Berlin have been done? Um, I don't think it could have been. I think that would have been highly... I mean, it could have started... It could have been heavier bombing of the uh, rural industrial area or something like that. That could have been attempted. That uh, po probably would, would, wouldn't have been a bad idea. I mean, Britain started what effectively were nuisance raids on Germany as from August of 1914. If you read uh, William Shirer's uh, Berlin Diary, for example, you can find out all about that. Second question was on why didn't the United Kingdom declare war on the Soviet Union? Yes, this is a very uh, easy question because it wasn't obliged to. It was only obliged to declare war on Germany, not on, um, not on the Soviet Union. The secret protocol to the Pact of Assistance of March 1939 has cl is clearly written that the only country the, the country referred to is uh, is Germany and is not the Soviet Union. So that, that that's the reason why. Uh, if uh, Stalin was more than happy to have entered the war on the side of um, Hitler, he said this openly. He made the offer openly to enter into. Um, to assist militarily and um yeah i i think if for example it was if british and french help uh, had arrived on time in finland and and we'd ended up in a war with the soviet union as well i think that that could have even produced an even worse result um i think i mean it's hard to say because i mean the result the result that was got in any case wasn't very good but uh, I think it could have been even worse. If the, the two had actually attacked the United Kingdom and France together and had defeated those two countries and then they'd fought it out amongst themselves, um, then oh, I think it's highly likely that Nazi Germany would have won. Anyway, that's, that's, my, that's my opinion. <laughs> uh, um, Ian says, Heavy Gustav defeated the Maginot line without fearing firing a shot well yeah the marginal light there was a pierce um i was looking i went to see a, fort, a fortification today uh here um and i was thinking about the, the 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 marginal line was actually pierced i was filming some uh about five weeks ago some fortifications here on what's called the pomeranian line it was originally built here it started in fact in the end of the 20s but in in the 30s but then it was heavily um done up again in 1944 just before the soviets got here and um uh, these positions they're, they're sort of really just positions they're not not like what the uh, russians have done now or soviets it's not sorry, russians it's not soviets have done in ukraine these are just sort of singular positions occupying a hill which gives a certain ability with artillery uh, to follow artillery spotting positions and things of this nature okay james writes just a quick question looking at the mistakes that hitler made that cost germany to lose the war would you what would you have done differently and with all we know now about how the war was won and lost right okay if we ask this question we've got to set a um we've got to set a target and the target uh so we we we've got to understand what the objective of the war is now if the objective of the war is to occupy the soviet union um then uh let's have a look at what you're going to have to do so the first mistake okay to do that got to occupy poland and to occupy poland bring it that it's going to bring france and britain into the war so that, that right so we've got to accept that so the first thing is in not knocking out britain that is the number one thing uh it was uh, hitler when he invaded uh soviet union thought that um 
that, that, that Britain really wasn't fighting any longer. Of course, there was a front in North Africa. Hitler didn't see that as being a front. Um, so um, also, for example, Mussolini got him himself, got him into more problems. If Mussolini had stayed neutral, uh, that, that probably would have been far better uh, for Hitler because this, this just brought a, a, a way for Britain to uh, attack um, via the back door, so to speak. The, so there's, there's the number one, that is the number one error, I would have to say, uh, in, 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 in the, uh, not finishing off the United Kingdom first. Now, next thing is, if you talk of the, the Soviet campaign, uh, it's, it's often said that the mistake was in not capturing Moscow. I, I, don't, sh I don't share that opinion uh, for a number of reasons. The largest concentration of troops which existed was in the region of Ukraine. And um, the fact that the defeat of the Soviet Union in the Battle of Kiev uh, in September of 1941 is the greatest military defeat uh, or, or victory in, in human history. Uh, 665,000, I think it was, uh, troops taken prisoner. So I think that that was absolutely necessary. Next thing it's often uh, put forward is that um, not allowing a, a, a retreat in December 1941. Uh, again, I disagree. I'd say that if, if they were there, then um, they they if they held on to positions at least that had certain amount of warmth and things of this nature which they wouldn't have had elsewhere if ha having said that i think there's a major mistake that the um hitler didn't pull his troops back uh, to prepared defensive lines earlier and so i would say that that was there's another major mistake um and going for Okay, so Stalingrad, well, I mean, the problem with the Stalingrad campaign was there was no clear objectives and the forces kept getting whittled down and um, there was no, uh, the, 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 the war in 1942 was largely, um, the offensive started off with huge traffic jams going back um, a very long way and uh, and then and the generals themselves not knowing what they were supposed to do uh, Hitler looking at maps but not understanding what the terrain was like in reality so um, I, I, there, there, yet another <laughs> yet another mistake but if you want the main number one mistake I think is this is not knocking Britain out of the war without without because if without with uh, with Britain the war the United States was going to come in sooner or later so uh, I'd have to say that that is, is that okay Oh, all right. I'll just put the light on over here. If I can reach it, is that any better? Yeah, it makes me look red now. Um, don't know if that answers the question or not. And uh, would I do a movie review on Europe, the final battle, or up the final battle? You know, I should do some movie. I thought about talking about my favourite ones. I don't know that bit of film. I can't. I can't discuss it. But I mean, I can say. I can say what my favourite. Uh, I can say what my favourite films are. Well, Downfall's the number one film, uh, without any doubt. Uh, Valkyrie's really good as well. Although there are some mistakes in there, but but with Valkyrie, I, I'll accept the mistakes as keeping the action action going. Um, the Bridget Ray Morgan, which admittedly is more of a fictional um, depiction, but it's very well done. Uh, so I, I, I would put that on as well. I think the longest day is brilliant. Um, I think thinking of the Second World War ones. I think that's about it, really. <laughs> uh, something else might might go, might come to mind, uh, but it's, it's for war films, I have to think. I, I think I put it with with those ones. Uh, I thought Saving Private Ryan had some good points to it as well, actually. But uh, even though it was a bit um, at times, uh, I thought it was a bit ridiculous at times. Uh, so yeah, yeah, Ian says this one could take all night. What was the objective not to enslave the, the Slavic peoples and create Lebensraum for Greater Germany? I think yeah, Hitler's talked of Lebensraum, uh, even uh, e even I think it was even Mein Kampf, and um, I personally think the point was to, to of the murder of the Jews. I think this was Hitler was so obsessed about this 
that 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 was the way to do it. Um, and I think that Lebensraum was a sort of a an additional uh, idea. But his the idea was this very extremely volkish idea that they would have these um, farmers, um, sort of armed farmers, uh, going out into uh, into Russia, and they would be sort of defending the frontier there. And I suspect that this might come from Hitler's early. Uh, his youth, because he really wasn't the Cowboys and Indians, but then again, who wasn't? Uh, but he was also really into the Boer War, uh, again, when you've got the armed farmers. Uh, so I, I wonder how much comes from that. Uh, so he, he's put these ideas from his youth and into this Volkish idea. Uh, the idea, of, uh, and the thing is, idea of Laban's, right? It's not, Hitler was no good at economics, he even said so, he didn't know anything about economics. And you know, it's often the the economic arguments which are used in the Third Reich are totally, are totally illogical. And the, if there was any economic um, revival, which I don't, I would argue there wasn't. But I think this was largely due to uh, world circumstances for number one, and number two, it was in spite of the government. But I, I don't think that Lebensraum is. I think the, the the Jews was the number one concern as far as Hitler was concerned. Amanda says, the PM at the time believed that Hitler could be trusted when he said that he would stick to just Czechoslovakia. Also at the time, Brits uh, and most of the government didn't want war. Yeah, oh, well, the thing is this, it's quite clear that nobody in the United Kingdom wanted war. Neville Chamberlain, it's clear also that he, he felt utterly betrayed by Hitler and he really went out of his way. But if we take Munich as an example, um, uh, Chamberlain made three trips to Germany. Okay, Munich's the most famous, but the, for example, to Bad Godesberg, which is on the Rhine, uh, just to the south of Cologne. And Hitler made demands. Uh, uh, Chamberlain got the Czechs to agree. Then Hitler changed his demands. Uh, it was in, in all, always putting on a, a time timeline. And at the same time as the deadline, uh, he, was, he, he was using these terror tactics. The, the, the use of these terrorists to create ethnic tensions cannot be under, uh, uh, can, cannot be under exaggerated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not bombing airfields. Yeah, it could have done. Which Valkyrie film? Sorry, uh, uh, 2008 Valkyrie film. I haven't seen the 2004 one. I think it's called Stauffenberg. It's a German film. Oh, sorry, it's another good film. I've just remembered. The German film Rommel. Uh, I think it's quite good. I, I think, actually, I like the German film Stalingrad, even though I think that the uh, there's one or two things I think are a bit daft in it. But I think, I think the music from it's great. <laughs> Uh, the Bunker is great. Uh, yeah, um, The Bunker was in 1981. It was based on the account of uh, there was an American journalist who actually managed to bluff his way into the bunker. And he, he worked, I think it was for life. And this was largely based on his account, what he wrote after the war. Uh, the thing with The Bunker is, is great as... The, uh, Anthony Hopkins is as a fantastic actor. The best role I have ever, or one of the best roles I've ever seen any male actor play was when he played Ciano in Mussolini and I. Oh, there's another film. Um, uh, but um, when you compare him to um, Mr. Gantz uh, playing Hitler in Downfall, then it is that every other actor fails after this. No one. No, it, it, that was an ultimate performance. <laughs> oh, the bridge too far, says Colin. Yes, a bridge too far is also brilliant. Historically, very accurate. Uh, although Cornelius Ryan, I think he, um, he, he certainly wasn't. I think he wrote the script to it as well. So that, then it would be. Um, uh, Vega said, "Did I understand you right when you said that Poland did not work against German expansionism before the attack?" Yes, that's what I said. It did nothing to assist 
the uh, Czechoslovakia, it did nothing to assist Austria, it did nothing to assist Lithuania. And by the time, to quote uh, Martin Niemöller, um, uh, um, by the time I needed help, there was nobody to help me, or paraphrasing Martin Niemöller, it's precisely what happened, yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, Ian says he prefers documentaries of his own. Yes, yes, so I, mean, yes, I think I do as well. But uh, anyway, good. Um, thanks so much for being here today. Actually, I did this because of um, I got one uh, comment from somebody on the video I did yesterday about Bidgosh. And that, that was actually because of this comment, uh, this the, well, I think a woman who is a neo-Nazi herself. Uh, but so... Um, but I thought, yeah, I thought this just sort of Nazi mentality on these um, uh, without looking at the reasons for the ethnic tensions. He's just sort of spouting out Nazi uh, propaganda. And that was what I wanted to do this. Uh, oh, bridge on the river Kwai, says Amanda. I watched, well, I said recently, I watched it about two years ago last time. Um, the Bridge on the River Kwai is an excellent film from a production point of view. I did, you know, I've done a video on it. Um, I've done a video on the real, the real, because I found an interview he gave, the real officer on the River Kwai, and the, uh, there was these legal problems after the River on the Kwai, Kwai uh, film came out. And uh, so I did a video on it. And I uh, wonder where it is. I never published it. Anyway, it'll be, it'll be on the hard disk somewhere. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think the, river, yeah, the, river Kwai, the bridge on the River Kwai was made in 1957 in Ceylon. And um, the bridge still stands, the one they built for the film, I'm, I'm, I'm led to believe. Fantastic film, in my opinion. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so we kept finding more and more and more, more films. I also like the film Spartacus. Spartacus is not a, uh, it's not historically accurate uh, at all, but um, I think it's brilliant. I, I mean, some of the actors in it and all the rest of it. Of course, that's not the Second World War. Yeah, I'll publish it when I, I get rid. Yeah, Amanda, I'm trying to get through things. Uh, the the the. I thought I'd sit down here in the summer and I'd just try and write things and and put things together again and um, that's what I'm trying to do gosh you know so many notes and things of this nature and uh, oh and Doc's reading nine by Paddy Ashdown details several instances where coup attempts were considered and delayed okay very good I don't know that one I know Paddy Ashdown of course and, and Collins in Spain no and Spa Spa, can't see what it says. Spa. Spartacus. I am Spartacus. Sorry, sorry. What a good World War II films. I think I just said that. The Mannerheim conversation has been remastered. It's worth a listen if you haven't already. Uh, yes, I've, yeah, I've heard that. Um, the man, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's quite curious because in the Mannerheim conversations with Hitler, um, it was on man, Mr. Mannerheim's birthday, it was 76th birthday, if I remember rightly. And uh, so Hitler turned up for his... Oh, that's a nice birthday present for him. And um, he... Um, uh, it's, it's the only time he actually hears only with Hitler with his sort of his normal speaking voice. Because otherwise, everything else you hear, I mean, he's got his um, performance voice on. Anyway, who knows, something else might yet turn up. So, thanks for thanks for being here. Thanks for listening, and I'll do something else tomorrow. I haven't decided what I'm doing, but it'll probably be something local uh, to this region where I am. I might do on the on the strikes of 1982. Uh, oh, oh, Amanda liked the film Passchendaele. Um, yes, uh, I haven't seen it, but um, yeah, I, I, I've seen clips from it. Did Hitler have an Austrian accent? He had a very Austrian accent, a very Viennese accent, I should say. Yeah, um, um, very much so, yeah. Um, occasionally also use Viennese turns of phrases as well, which people didn't necessarily under understand what he, what he meant. A bit like that singer, what's his name? The De Commissar Falco. He used Viennese uh, expressions in his songs. And um, uh, particularly De, uh, there's something in that, that. There's a line in De Commissar. I can't remember it now, but uh, where, where he uses his very Viennese expression. 
Okay, thanks Ian for being here. Thank you, thanks everyone else for coming here. And how about the bottling up of the Wehrmacht in hell, says Colin. Yeah, there's a there's a good topic actually, because I, I was on the beach in Oxivia uh, in November. And I sort of did a little video on on on, on that mentioned that subject. Yeah. Uh, oh, um, pray, thank you from um, Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. Okay, thank you. My, I had relatives in Woodstock, <laughs> uh, which is that? No, no, it's Mon Montreal. Sorry, sorry. Um, anyway, thank you. <laughs> All the best. Bye for now. Bye.